Contrasting Viewpoints with Ray Sclafani and Mark Hurley. Ray has been one of the leading consultants in the financial services industry for many years. And Mark has annoyed countless people throughout the wealth management industry over the last 25 years with the white papers he has written. Today, they are going to provide their insights into what is really going on in the industry, some of the more absurd things they've seen, and also for anyone in this industry, some issues they should be thinking about as they try to build their business. Welcome back. My name is Ray Sclafani, and I'm co-hosting this podcast with Mr. Mark Hurley. It's great to be back with you. Uh, it's great to do it again. All right. So in our podcast format, we're going to cover uh, some articles. Uh, we've got some interesting topics today from longevity to the M&A deal activity, leading lawsuits uh, all the way up to uh, you have got to be kidding me. There are some really interesting uh, topics. Our main event today will be really thinking about what clients want in the future. But Mark, what do you say we get right into it? Outstanding. I'd like to just hit the first article that caught my attention this month. Uh, came from Evan Simonoff at FA Mag. This this longevity, how long and bright a future? You know, this one's interesting to me because uh, Laura Carstensen uh, has a remarkable new book called A Long Bright Future, where she talks a great deal about uh, sort of all the longevity studies uh, are being r- are wrong. They're they're being misinterpreted, and I'm curious what your take is. Well, Laura is uh, really one of the great forward thinkers that we have in our country about the issue of, of longevity. She runs the Stanford Longevity Center. And one of the things she's pointed out is that when you talk about what life expectancy is, it's almost like backwards looking radar. What I mean by that is the statistics, uh, if 70% of the increases in longevity that are reflected in the current statistics are from declines in infant mortality. The numbers don't reflect, however, new meds, better lifestyles, any of this kind of stuff. And so if you read the book and if you're in this industry, you should That's read this read. book. It's yeah, a must read. Absolutely. Because she says, if, if you make it to like 60, there's two things that really determine how long you're going to live. And one of those is your education. And the other one is your wealth. I mean, this is separate from your DNA. But, okay, well, who do wealth managers work with? They tend to work with educated, wealthy people. And it's her view that the odds of getting to 100 are increasing. Much higher. So think about this. All of a sudden, our whole society has to deal with an extra 25 to 30 years of longevity that nobody was counting on. And if you're a wealth manager, and you've got all these plans for the money and everything, uh-oh, this changes a lot. Yeah, the, the game changes. And if you're the kids hoping to inherit the money, well, understand, mom and dad are living longer, and they're going to spend more of this. So all these future forecasts of how much money is coming back, well, I, I, I'm not sure there'll be as much there as people are hoping for. Yeah, so that uh, definitely uh, gets my attention. And uh, anytime that we can start uh, talking to clients, the advisors can be t- begin talking to clients more about longevity and thinking more and more about that planning as a process is key. Yeah, and there's a wealth management firm that's done an extraordinary job in this. It's called Halbert Hargrove. And they're working on what's called a new map of life, which is helping clients think about, okay, a much longer life and the different stages to address this. Because the one thing that does kill you is if you don't have anything planned when you get into your mid-60s as to what you do next. Yeah. And the later in life, uh, rethinking the plan, knowing uh, that it's all wrong and you've got to control, alt, delete uh, is uh, more than stressful. Oh, yes. So uh, that's a that's a really great pickup. Hey, let's switch gears and go over to the latest Fidelity report on M&A. Uh, the activity in Q1, uh, the numbers uh, jump out at me, but I don't think they tell the whole story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. First off, the Fidelity Report is phenomenal. It's If you're at all involved in M&A or thinking about selling your firm, the, the, they this is a great resource that they provide. But they show up with 16 deals. And the problem is, is that there's many, many deals occurring, but they're very small. And this reflects a broader trend, I think, that's going on in the industry. Even these numbers reflect this. If you look at this quarter uh, versus, say, a year ago this quarter, uh, this quarter you you, you had – Transactions to- totaling twenty three billion dollars, but a lot of those well, trans- one of them was GWA, right? Right, and and, and, and focus, and and and, and was, it's like saying I'm selling something to myself. Yeah, and so they, let's count it. And they counted several of those deals in those numbers. Yeah, that's right. So uh, it's 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 a bit it's a bit small. I think you're this is the new future, the new the new reality. Uh, lots and lots of deals, much much smaller. Yeah. So my experience is, uh, I think in the first quarter, we had uh, clients of ours, either buyers or sellers, 
we had uh, more than 20 transactions in the first quarter uh, th- that I'm aware of. Uh, but to your point, they're smaller deals. Uh, there's a lot more uh, 300, 400, 500 million dollar firms merging together, uh, selling into a larger firm. And those transactions don't seem to get counted in anybody's reports. Yeah, even seven of the 16 that Fidelity reported were under $500 million. Yeah. So there's a, an interesting uh, maybe lack of analysis, but I agree with you that Fidelity report is among the very best um, and, and something uh, worth paying attention to. So so let's talk about these uh, fewer deals, smaller deals. Uh, uh, you know, Debt's uh, getting more expensive. It's not cheap. And while there's been a flood of private equity coming into the marketplace, let's just peel the onion back a little bit. I've heard you say uh, the middle of the industry has been hollowed out. That's right. I mean, mean go back a few years. We had companies with five to $15 billion transacting all the time. And these were some of the finest firms in this industry. I can think of, you know, 20 names that would go, oh my God, what a great firm. And what drives deals, first and foremost, is not economics, it's demographics. And when the founders get to a certain age, at some point, they have to monetize their ownership. Well, those are the guys who started their firms in the early 90s. And now they're all kind of gone. They just, just creep it up. <laughs> they're, 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 and there's still a lot of firms out there that are quite exceptional. But a lot of those firms have decided they just don't want to sell. They'd rather remain independent. They have great businesses. They don't need to. But uh, if you're an M&A person, this is an interesting conundrum. I mean, think of it before. You could go borrow an insane amount of money at almost zero, zero interest rate and buy whatever you wanted to. And so, as we talked about in the white paper you put out in December, you, everybody was betting heavily on a rising tide. Just buy it. Who cares what the price is? Just buy it because the market will bail us out over time. It papers over all of our mistakes. Now, money is not as available. It's a heck of a lot more expensive. And there are 100 buyers. So, everybody's chasing. So, it, you know, in a much tougher economic environment, there's much more competition. So, so let's talk about the smaller deals for a second. I have an off the wall question for you. Uh, maybe something we didn't talk about previously that that's what makes these uh, conversations maybe so powerful. Uh, but the listeners will be the judge of that. My take is that there are way more uh, RIAs that just are not growing. If you strip out uh, all the capital markets, if you strip out any m and uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, there's only, you know, 5%, 6% or so of the RIAs out of 30,000 uh, RIAs that are doing any growth whatsoever. They account for 71% of all the growth. So, you know, these smaller deals, are are, are they also because uh, firms just frankly aren't growing and well, they're looking for scale? Is there something else hidden there? What, what, what's I, your I think it's a mix. First off, you're right. There are a smaller subset of firms that are growing really well. Fidelity did a study. Uh, a while back and found that something like 70% of the firms that they were custodying for weren't growing. At one, this is a few years back. Uh, and over 70% of the growth in the industry has been from infl- uh, asset inflation, not from new clients. Uh, most of the industry kind of went some ambulant. But why are the deals happening? One, uh, there are very large firms that are still growing and have continued to grow at an extraordinary rate. One of the best firms in the industry is a firm called Beacon Point. Well run, excellent firm. When well, you, good management you, and and Mariner, they just consistently, Marty consistent, and the team Marty, there consistently. Look at wealth enhancement group. Boy, well run. Right. Same thing. Jeff Deco is uh, doing an amazing, amazing job. job. You yeah. go look at a pure, which is a smaller version. Mm-hmm. Same thing, growing at a ferocious rate. In fact, if you look at someone like Weg or you look at uh, someone like Pure, the reason they're doing deals is to get bodies. It's almost like back in the yeah. old days when there was a shortage of certain types of chips and people would buy old cell phones just to worry about the chips. They're buying the firm, not for the book. They're buying the firm to get the people because yeah. they can fill them up with clients. Merit Financial is in that boat as well. Absolutely. They're looking for talent. It's an aqua hire. I think I've heard the term. Uh, great, great brands. They already know how to bring clients to the door. The question is having the people to handle them correctly. On the other extreme, there are some unnamed organizations that quite candidly were buying anything they could because they were trying to get as long as they could on the market while it was rising. And to the credit of their investors, they made a lot of money doing this. Okay, well, that party's over. And now you're seeing a lot of forced rationalization. And the hardest part for these organizations is going to be changing their culture, because how do you go from not marketing to marketing is unbelievably hard. So I've heard folks, uh, advisors tell me, hey, Mariner looks more like Merrill Lynch uh, today uh, and will in the future. I don't know that I agree with that. I worked at Merrill Lynch 
Let me assure you, it does not look like Merrill Lynch. It is not. It, it is an unbelievably entrepreneurial organization run by people spending their own money to run the company. Merrill Lynch, which is a great organization, but it's corporate America. So uh, Rick Kent, uh, who's the CEO at Merit Financial and Kaylin Mayhew, who's their president, has often talked about the importance of that entrepreneurial mindset and about culture. How do CEOs, how do leaders, when they're thinking about merging and coming together, uh, maintain that entrepreneurial mindset? How is Marty doing it? Uh, well, Marty, Marty and Shannon and Jeff, always, they don't just buy anything. <laughs> they, 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 it's a very selective process. They, they, they're not being measured by their number of deals they do. They're being measured by what the long-term outcomes of the organization is. And the only way you achieve that is to be very disciplined and very systematic about what you're doing. I would add selective. So disciplined, yes. uh, orderly, and selective, which is why perhaps fewer deals, uh, but better deals uh, in well, the future. Well, yeah. I, again, I think part of it is a supply and demand question too, though. In other words, there's still going to be lots and lots of deals, but they're going to be much tinier than they were before, simply because there aren't that many big firms that are left out there. Uh, does the lifestyle practice, I, I, I use that term tongue in cheek because for 35 years I've heard that term. Uh, I think we share maybe a similar view on the idea of lifestyle practice. Uh, maybe you approach it with a sledgehammer. I, I put a little velvet glove on it. But at the end of the day, how can you be a fiduciary? Uh, how can you not grow organically? and consider yourself acting in the best interest of, do those firms uh, ultimately acquiesce? Well, um, first off, I prefer sweet and sensitive instead of sledgehammer, but. Um, <laughs> I look, don't think you are sweet and sensitive, <laughs> but. I, I think I referred to them as barbershops once and boy, that got me that all kinds of great fan good. mail. Yeah, right, right. But look, they have a real conundrum. The clients sign up for, be taken care of over the long term. If the organization's not growing and creating opportunities for other people to come in and succeed, how are they going to recruit anybody? Well, that's perhaps, I'm thinking, smaller deals in the future. And well, who wants to buy, though, a, an organization with a bunch of very old clients? Owen Dahl, uh, who leads our valuation services at ClientWise, said to me, Ray, there's an immense correlation between the age of the advisor and the age of clients that it used to be when you did a valuation, you had to collect all that client data. And today you don't need to because it exceeds 90%. Yep. So interesting thought. Okay, let's move on to the, the third uh, interesting uh, article uh, from wealthmanagement.com. Mariner comes up under fire in the courts. Uh, this is an interesting one because uh, Mariner, we talked about Marty just a moment ago, but he's been hit with multiple lawsuits filed by a trio of competitors, uh, Advantex, uh, Edelman, RWA, uh, accusing Mariner of aggressive recruiting tactics that fall outside of the bounds of normal business. A quote from the article. This is an interesting one, and lawsuits seem to be problematic uh, for the litigant. What do you, what do you think? Well, look, uh, litigation only matters if you can, one, either bankrupt the person because you got a lot more money than they do, so you can just litigate them till they give up. Or two, you can get an enormous award. Well, how's that going to happen here? First, do you actually think that Mariner, the, the litigation costs here are going to really move the needle for them? This is like a gnat biting at them. Number two, you have to prove damages. Okay, so what are the damages? Someone doesn't work for you anymore? What, what they could have potentially made for you? If they aren't stealing the clients... What are they getting? Also, most restrictive covenants, states don't like these generally. And they uh, I've never seen ones that are enforceable generally beyond a couple of years. How often do you even meet with clients? Once a year, twice a year? Most clients don't even know their advisors left for a couple of years. And at that point, he's recruiting them. So what's your damage claim? So I think this is going to be the new reality for recruitment. Uh, as I said in that paper in December, Everybody who's smart is going to run up the Jolly Roger. Granted, Mar Marty does it with more flair than others. But the danger, if you're a wealth management firm and you're smaller and the big guys come after your clients, what kind of deep pockets do you have to try to bang it out with them? You know, the idea of spending $10 million for litigation over an employee, that's not going to change Marty's lifestyle. Yeah, it's not going to change any of the big guys' lifestyles. But if you have a business that's got 
you know, eight, seven, 800 million of assets. That's, that's a big deal. Well, what this signals for me is maybe something different. Uh, not, not so much the litigation angle, but I look at this article and it's a, a reminder that we're going to be talking a lot more about talent in the future. Uh, I've come off of uh, the last couple of weeks attending some conferences, whether it was uh, the Pershing Elite Advisor Conference. Uh, uh, they did a really great job bringing their best advisors together. I was at the Barron's Hall of Fame. You got to be ranked 10 years or more to be ranked as an advisor. And then last week I was up in Boston at uh, Chip Rome's Tiburon uh, CEO Summit. And, and, and at each of these three meetings, very different meetings, by the way, one maybe uh, a little more wirehouse centric with the Barron's Hall of Fame group, uh, Pershing clearly more RIA uh, centric, uh, the CEO summit much more uh, strategic and uh, higher uh, level uh, with senior executives. The, the, the common theme was about organic growth and where the talent's going to come from. And this catches my attention because I see an article like this and I think, yeah, there's one thing related to uh, demonstrating damages, but there's another thing if you're future focused and serious about growth, that if you're going to put the hammer down on organic growth and make that a primary focus uh, for a firm, you're going to need the talent to do so. And we look at the expansion of talent in this industry, you know, the Merrill Lynch's and Morgan Stanley's and Edward Jones and Northwestern Mutuals, who were the big hirers. Uh, and recruiters of new young talent to the profession aren't all playing the same way they were. And the training for advisors is different than it was 25 years ago, which is sales training. Today, it looks very different. At the same time, we have an increase in CFP uh, uh, graduates in the U.S. uh, more than ever before. More universities are launching uh, those types of programs. So I sit back and look at this article and think, man, this is a this is a future uh, story that that is going to continue to unfold because not every firm can afford to wait five and seven and 10 years to develop somebody internally. So what once was a very collegiate sort of industry where, you know, people helped each other out. I see much sharper elbows when it comes to talent. Well, that is why we named the paper. Welcome to the jungle. Welcome to the jungle. Baby. And a few thoughts. The industry looks like a shrinking geriatric ward. It's already pretty old. And it's That's harsh. Get, That's tough. Well, it's going to get smaller. We, it just look at the demographics. I don't know. So, you know, we, well, we've been saying for years, right? Uh, uh, well, wait a second. Yes, you've got a lot of new people coming in. But what wealth managers do fundamentally is help people manage the most complicated relationship in their life, which is their relationship with money. This is why AI is never going to replace it. This is why that I agree fintech, with. et cetera, yeah. for all of its wonders. It, it may improve technology and efficiency, but humans yeah. want to work with humans. And, but the kind of person who can do that, you can't go to a training program and do that. Right. This takes many years yeah. of experience, uh, training, and judgment. And this is the challenge. There's a gap in this industry. It has a generation gap of people. Uh, so what's it going to mean? Well, the first rule in the jungle is to not get eaten. So if you're running a wealth management business, you better figure out how to make it so it's unattractive for someone to hire your best people because someone else will, period. The second question is, where do you get the people you need? Well, if you're a smaller firm, can you afford to compete for this? But that points to even the real more critical uh, uh, structural issue, which Michael Kitsis has done an extraordinary job of talking about, which is the operating model of most wealth managers. Most firms have maybe one or two people are good at bringing clients in. And the whole model now is you go build a book of business. And once your book is built, you kind of service it and live a good life. That's crazy because the other people, there's there's far more people who can service than there are people who can bring clients in. And so what you're going to see the most successful firms do is set up compensation programs. So the people who market, that's all they do. They just bring clients in. Let people service do the servicing. But making that shift is going to be brutally hard. That's a a, a brutal move uh, for many uh, but again, I look at this article and think if we're if we're serious about organic growth, we better be equally serious about finding the talent to serve uh, the clients uh, and what we're doing in marketing. So we'll talk more about that in future episodes. But that was a really that's a great that's a great article. One want to look out. Let me jump to uh, CityWire. CityWire had an interesting article about P.E. versus hedge funds um, and that P.E. firms have woken up. Uh, to the independent uh, model. And this jumps off the page at me. Yeah. Well, the PE firms have 
uh, traditionally gotten their money from sovereigns. And the sovereign funds have massive bargaining power. If you have a trillion dollars, you can be pretty good at bargaining. And um, what they typically do now with most of the PE firms is they'll say, I'll give you $500 million invested in your fund, but you're going to give me a billion dollars of co-investment with no fees. So they effectively cut their fees by two thirds. And increasingly, the, the sovereigns are trying to disseminate them. You have firms like OTTP in Canada, CPP, uh, even Mabotal is doing deals directly now. So if you're a PE firm, boy, is this wealth management industry look lovely. None of the firms here are big enough to have the bargaining power of an ADIA. Uh, and as a consequence, they, they don't have to cut the same kind of deals. And the money in this industry is so ferociously stable. In other words, once you convince a wealth manager to provide you capital, and as long as you do a reasonably good job, yeah, the retention think, rates are high off the charts. The revenue. And then wealth managers have figured out that pr private equity, quite candidly, is a is a somewhat of a surrogate for public equities. It's not identical, but it's really not that different in a lot of ways. We used to think of getting into private equity because you're going to get like 15 to 20 percent returns every year, and that was the great dream. And the world's rationalized. You, 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 you know, if you have good PE managers, you'll probably beat public equities a little bit, but it's not the end of the world, but it's just becoming a standard allocation. Hedge funds, on the other hand, what this article talks about, they're a little more exotic, a little more volatile, a little less core in a lot of ways. And so, and they're really, a, in some ways, they, they're intended to be a substitute for not, not really for fixed income, not really for public equities, et cetera. And so that's why I'm, it's very unremarkable that you're seeing so much money going into private equity firms from wealth managers. Yeah, I think the jury's still out. There's a lot of uh, story yet to be told related to how private equity firms are shaping and perhaps reshaping uh, the independent and RIA channels. A friend of mine uh, who uh, knows uh, one of the CEOs of one of the largest firms in the world had dinner with him a while back, and he told him he thought within 10 years that their firm would have no more money from sovereigns. They'd have to find it somewhere else which means, well, where's, the, where's all the money at? It's with wealth managers. Yeah. So we're going to watch this, uh, this unfold. So uh, a good CityWire article to pick up on. Okay, you have got to be kidding me. Merciless analysts on the latest BlackRock earnings call peppering executives with questions about sub-5% organic asset growth. This article is absolutely ridiculous. At $10.5 trillion and organic growth of 5% per year, which is $525 billion, at some point, organic growth goes down and market uh, drives outcomes. Holy smokes, what an attack on BlackRock unnecessarily. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. First off, this is RA biz and, you know, they check, check and recheck. But, um, they, you know, is the idea that they ultimately are supposed to have all the money in the world? I mean, this is an extraordinarily successful firm. The bigger you get, the reality is your growth rate goes down. It just gets harder and harder. Um, yes, they innovate new things constantly. They're a very savvy business. But I kind of viewed this article as a backdoor swipe at InvestNet. For some reason, uh, this publication seems to be mad at InvestNet about something. They, we, we talked about on our last podcast how they went after uh, Bill Craig and and it was really silly what they were saying there. Uh, I, 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 again, my experience with certain publications is uh, unless you're leaking them information and giving them hot tips or stories, they tend to write negative things about you. And I'm wondering if that's the case here. Well, it's living proof that you just can't uh, believe everything that you read. Uh, On the Internet, not always. And, you know, there's a reason why the National Enquirer is widely read but not widely believed. OK, let's move on to our main topic. Uh, what will clients want in terms of services in the future? Now, this is an important uh, topic for anybody that's looking to build an enduring firm, uh, somebody that's thinking about what the next evolution of services looks like. Uh, in uh, your white paper, Welcome to the Jungle, uh, you talk a great deal about specialization. Uh, and I'm also thinking about the family office space. Uh, not just the ultra high net worth, but the high net worth side of the space and where things evolve. So let, let take us back to uh, what you're seeing as an evolution in services and support. Creatives doing it differently than Mariners doing it. That's different from Bank of America. Merrill Lynch is doing it. But you got to watch the landscape and competition isn't just the firm on the corner block in your local town. Yeah, yeah. Um well, for starters, there's been a consistent evolution over the last 30 years of services that start at the ultra high net worth 
migrate down in a form that's useful for the high net worth customer down to the wealth manager. If you think back, if you're those of us that are old enough, um, a lot of firms were investment only. And then later they had to add extra services, financial planning. And then, oh my goodness, we should help with their taxes. All this stuff was done for years by family offices. And it's this gradual migration continues. So if you want to get a sense of what you'll be doing in a wealth management firm 10 to 15 years from now, just go look at family offices and then say, how is it of what they do for their clients? Could we do something that would be useful for our clients? Now, what are clients going to want? I don't think anybody knows. And I think there are some uh, very bright, initiative firms out there that are saying, well, we have an ideas and we're going to start changing the discussion. But what's clear is if you have competitors offering to do more for the same dollars, even if your clients don't want all those services, they're going to ask you, okay, why am I paying you the same here when I'm not using those services? This creates a dilemma. And so I would strongly advise any wealth manager, every wealth manager to start thinking about what is it that we do that will be unique that's very important to the clients. So I don't get that question because otherwise you're going to have to try to match toe to toe with some of these guys. Look, look at like creative planning right now. They have a whole separate unit that's helping people create their wealth. So does Mark Mirror, entire set of services. I think every firm at some point is going to play a bigger role, particularly with helping create wealth. The question is how and what role they'll play in that. I hear consistently from advisors that uh, they are playing more and more of a role as a project manager or facilitator uh, for their clients, managing the complexity of all things related to wealth. And in fact, um, that word facilitation jumps off the page at me because the root word is facile, which means to make easy. And I'm hearing from independent advisors over and over and over again that it's not just products and services. It's also about the way with which you're helping the clients navigate wealth. And you said it earlier, you look at creative planning, uh, they're helping clients create the wealth, uh, not only create it, but then knowing what to do with it. So, uh, for example, the Ultra High Net Worth Institute has done a marvelous job uh, studying the ultra high net worth and family office space. And they've got some really excellent displays on their website and some research that wor is worth subscribing to that really frames up not only the parts of wealth uh, management uh, that we've moved table stakes is beyond the investment management, uh, move beyond financial planning. I see this role as facilitator, navigating the estate attorney, the tax, the trust, uh, and then expanding into family meetings and legacy planning and gift giving and gift planning strategies. Uh, the evolution of what a client wants in the future, while we don't know, uh, I can't think of uh, anybody who doesn't want uh, the, the simplicity uh, uh, from the complexity. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's a great insight. Unburdening the client is yes. the way I would think of this. Yeah. Now, that said, the one thing I think, though, will be critical is... In this industry, I believe in 10 to 15 years, you will go from helping people manage their wealth to playing an integral role in helping them create their wealth. I see wealth management firms, even small boutiques, who target a certain type of client, let's say a AI software engineers, let's say that was your specialty. They're going to hire someone from one of the executive recruiters and have them as a partner at the firm to help these guys plan their careers. The big firms are already taking unloading a lot of the responsibility from business owners and taking care of that for them as part of their services already. And if you think about it, if I'm a, a business owner, anybody can help me just simplify my life and take care of this stuff for me. Oh my goodness, that's just a fundamentally different conversation. You know, it's interesting off the creative planning website, it says our wealth managers collaborate with a team of in-house attorneys who draft custom trust and estate planning documents to help ensure your wishes are fully integrated with your financial plan. That integration of services uh, should be a real wake up call for the little uh, firms, not just the creative planning as to what the future is really going to look like. Yeah. And if you look at their website, also, they talk about they do everything from audit to attestation, business taxes, accounting and bill pay, payroll services, legal, M&A and consulting. And I think the most powerful thing they do on that thing is the consulting. They, they play a role in serving as the advisor, not the financial advisor to the client. So, so let me just pull this thread while we're talking about this topic. It's clear that advisors need to be thinking more about the future and what clients want. 
Uh, Julie Littlechild uh, does a great job at helping advisors survey clients and uh, think through what clients are looking for, what value the clients perceive. But I'm going to ask you off the wall about fees for a moment. You know, this fee on AUM, Mark DeBersion had that uh, brilliant quote uh, decades ago. Uh, this is an industry where the value of what the client brings to the relationship as opposed to what value the advisor brings to the client is how pricing is uh, uh, built. Now, that, that gets my attention because uh, when you do think about a fee on AUM model, while the PE firms, the durability, they love the subscription model revenue, while at the same time, uh, that isn't always how advisors uh, deliver value in terms of investment management. They do far more. And we're saying here, hey, wait a minute, in the future, clients are going to want something different, but yet the model is mostly fee on AUM driven. So juxtapose this for me for a moment. Yeah. How does an advisor- Most of this is, that, that is the real dilemma because the compensation model doesn't correlate with the value model. And- that much said, it's the greatest compensation model in the world. It's not just a subscription business. I don't think it's changing in my lifetime. Probably not, because no one wants it to change. So what they'll do instead is expand their services as a way to cover up the fact that it really is not correlated. But like, for example, where it starts to break down is with the ultra net worth. In other words, if you're working with clients who've got $1 to $20 million, it's an asset-based fee that gradually ratchets down as a percentage of assets. But you go from, say, a $50 million client to a $200 million client, the fee on assets ain't that much more because they're, they're savvy enough to know they don't have to pay that kind of fee and the value isn't there. It will creep down a little bit more. But I think actually what instead, there's still a lot of room for wealth managers to bring more value as part of their core services. And that'll delay any of that kind of shift down. But think about why it's such a fabulous model. It's not just subscription. You get an automatic inflator over time from the market. You get an inflator over time. You never send out a bill. Client never writes the check. Brilliant. So uh, uh, one of the challenges I get advisors in our coaching programs to think about is this notion that if tomorrow you actually had to break down the fee into quarterly invoicing and you had to mail out an invoice to a client who is paying you $10,000 a year in fees and once a quarter you were going to ask the client to pull out their checkbook. I mean, who uses a checkbook anymore? So this is a ridiculous exercise. But I want the advisors to think, if you got to get Mr. and Mrs. Lubner to write a check for $2,500 this quarter, and then again next quarter, and then two more quarters after that, at some point they may look up and say, hey, what are we doing for that $2,500? And I think your point's a good one, that advisors, I don't know that I use the word cover-up, I might use the words uh, more so value creation. What is the uh, what is it that clients want and need? Different clients are going to value uh, something different. Some are going to value somebody operating as a more facilitator. Some are going to value talking to their kids about legacy planning. Others are going to value helping them mitigate taxes and reducing risk using insurance products. Uh, there's going to be, a, I think, a plethora of value creation, but the the value is always in the eye of the beholder. And so advisors who are getting more and more curious about what clients value uh, will be the winners in the future. And they will expand services because that's what the clients are looking for. Yeah. And I think there's an urgency. And the reason is, is that as we talked about in the paper, we had this decade long party where markets only go just, up, went, not just go up, but go up at an insane rate. Right? So, you know, a diversified portfolio compounded at more than 10% a year after inflation for 10 years. And so, you know, meetings with clients were hug fests. All the plans not only were met, they were exceeded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, okay, one, it'd be great if we could have another decade like that. I wouldn't count on it. But if we don't, yeah, there's very quickly going to be a lot of scrutiny. Okay, now how many dollars am I paying you? And what am I getting for that in exchange? Well, about every 12 to 18 months, I think it's important for advisors to ask clients uh, four to five very specific questions. Hey, what's the one thing you value most about my firm and I and how we serve you? What's the one thing you'd want us to change or improve? How would you describe our services to somebody else? And the most important uh, question of all, which should also be asked not once every 12 to 18 months, but at the end of every client meeting, and that is, hey, Mark, by the way, since we last met, what do you believe we've achieved together? 
Yeah, but I also think there's an element of uh, sustainability in the model due to the aggravation quotient. Mm. There's, yes. there's the upfront process of getting financially organized and financial planning, which is a subset of all that. It, it's it's a very emotional. You have to actually make a bunch of decisions for the long term, et cetera, and you get set up. And then after you've done that, the clients kind of shift in mode from one of, uh, you know, why, why should I keep you to why shouldn't I keep you? And what smart firms are going to do is they're going to play a larger role in the client's life with these services so that this aggravation quotient gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Let's say I'm doing your bill pay, your receivables management. I'm tracking the basis in your house for you. Um, I help you with your real estate stuff too. Uh, I play a role in your career planning. Man, all of a sudden I got to replace you. Oh, I got to go through it all again. Oh, I'd rather have my teeth drilled. And what it does is it, it reduces some of the potential volatility from uh, down downdrafts of the markets. Now, to be sure, Turnovers right now is so trivial in this industry. It's like three or 4%. I do think that's going to go up over time. I think that was really reflecting the long-term bull market and, and a comfort. And after you've done been with somebody for so many years, it's hard to shift. But I do think that smart firms are going to increasingly make it so that they so unburden the client that shifting becomes a major burden. And we'll leave it at that. From longevity uh, to m a activity, to litigations, uh, to maybe a little over uh, aggressive uh, on the BlackRock thing. I thought that was good to this talk of what the clients want in the future. Mark, thanks uh, for the conversation today. I enjoyed it. Thank you.